In 1948, following the end of the British Mandate in Palestine, the State of Israel as a Jewish state was declared by David Ben-Gurion, executive head of the World Zionist Organization in what is referred to by Palestinians as the Nakba, or catastrophe. Conflict in the region continues to this day. But despite the prevalence of nationalism, small groups within Israel have opposed Zionism and colonialism and instead fought for socialism. This is Working Class History. Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of the Working Class History Podcast. My name is Matt and today is the first of a two-part on the anti-Zionist movement in Israel with a particular focus on the revolutionary socialist group Matzben. A small group originating in a split from the Israeli Communist Party in 1962, Matzben punched far above their weight gaining a profile which made them infamous in Israel for their uncompromising line on the occupied territories and the Zionist project as a whole. Over the next couple of episodes, we're going to hear from some Matzben activists and talk about their experiences of radical political organising inside Israel. First up, we hear from one of Matzben's founders, Moshe Machova, to hear about his part in this fascinating chapter of working class history. Before we sort of start talking about Matzben, I was wondering, I was hoping you could maybe explain uh, to some of our listeners what Zionism is. It's really fairly simple because Zionism is is both a project and an ideology. Mm-hmm. So, uh, as an ideology, it is uh, the claim that Jews all over the world are not a religious denomination, but a nation. And the second part of it is that the real homeland of this nation is the land of Israel, which is roughly what uh, used to be called Palestine, uh, but may be defined as a little bit larger than Palestine as it was under the British mandate. But the land of Israel, the ancient homeland of the Mm. Jewish nation, and so, just quickly, because the, the British mandate was the part of Palestine, or part of the Middle East, that was run by the British it at was, the time. Well, I, I can go into this because the history is a bit complicated, but to put it very simply, it was uh, between uh, the end of the, the, the uh, First World War and 1947 48 was part of the Middle East. Uh, under the British mandate, which meant that the League of Nations, which was the international organization set up after the First World War, Mm -hmm. gave Britain a mandate to to rule Palestine, not as part of, uh, eternally part of the British Empire, but to look after it, as it were, (laughs) uh, until such time as the natives could uh, uh, rule themselves. Aha, uh-huh. yes, the quote-unquote. This, this, was, this, this yeah. was the mandate system okay. uh, run by the League of Nations. Anyway, so, but uh, uh, the, the uh, part of Zionist ideology is that the, the uh, homeland, ancient homeland uh, of the uh, Jewish nation is uh, that land of Israel, which is roughly Palestine, uh, and that, uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, I can put it like this, in order to be a Zionist, you don't have to believe in God. And most early Zionists were atheists, they didn't believe in God, but they, they did believe that God uh, promised the, that part of the world to the Jews. The claim of the uh, so-called Jewish nation over that part of the world is based essentially on religion, mm. which is a sort of a, a rather contradiction within that. Yes. And finally, uh, Zionist ideology uh, claims that it is the right of the Jewish nation to colonize that part of the world, which when Zionism came into being was not inhabited mainly by Jews. Jews were a minority, uh, m- maybe between 5 and 10% of the population of Palestine as it was there, 
but uh, Zionist ideology uh, claims that it is the right of the Jewish nation to colonize Palestine. And they did use the word colonize in, uh, at the time. It wasn't uh, uh, regarded uh, among, even among liberals then as a dirty word. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they, they used it freely. Mm -hmm. Then they used other words, settlement, settle, settlement, uh, they, they speak now about settlements rather than colonies. But mm -hmm. that, that's basically, which brings me to the Zionist project. And the Zionist project is the project of uh, uh, implementing this ideology by colonizing Palestine. So uh, the Zionist project is the project of colonizing Palestine, the land of Israel, mm. by Jews, so as to establish a Jewish nation state with an inbuilt and uh, a secure Jewish majority. Mm. And um, because there was a, you know, a large part of the Zionist movement was, you know, you know, left. Were there any, were there any attempts uh, at Jewish workers and Arab workers or Palestinian workers to, to organize together, uh, either politically or in unions, it, during the mandate period? Yeah, well, the, 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 there were such ma uh, uh, attempts, mm. and politically they uh, were often sort of um, under the leadership or, or sponsorship of the Palestinian Communist Party. Mm. But the, the uh, Jewish settlers were, that were involved, or the Jewish workers that were involved in these joint struggles, were uh, mostly those who, who actually became anti zionist Because, uh, yes, I mean, the, the uh, uh, Zionist colonization in its early days, until well into the, the, the history of Israel itself, after it was created, was led by so-called left-wing Zionists or workers, uh, working class Zionists. But, I mean, the, 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 these, these, uh, the, the uh, Zionist uh, work, workers' parties were in, in great conflict with the local Palestinian working class because they regarded them as an obstacle that whereas in places like Algeria or South Africa, the settlers built their economy on the exploitation of the labor power of the indigenous population. In Palestine, Zionist colonization behaved more like the colonization of Australia or North America, where the indigenous population was surplus to requirement. It was supposed to be displaced. Mm. Certainly the Zionist project involved displacing the, the uh, indigenous people. So the, the, the logic of this is clear because you couldn't create a Jewish nation state with the Jewish majority if it was, the economy was supposed to be based on exploiting the local labor because the people who actually do the work are always the majority. So the, the existence of a, a Palestinian Arab working class was an impediment. They had to be displaced and, and in fact, uh, uh, individual Jewish capitalists, farmers and others who employed Palestinian workers were uh, forced by actual threats mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, sometimes by uh, violence on the part of the Zionist workers' organizations mm -hmm. to dismiss, to sack their Arab workers mm -hmm. and to employ Jewish Settler workers instead. The policy described here by Moshi was known at the time as Hebrew labor. In this clip, taken from a talk in 2009, Akiva Orr, another founding member of Matzben, more commonly known as Aki to his friends, explains the role which the Histadrut had as the Zionist movement's central labor organization in enforcing the policy. And the first activity of Ben Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, when he started the Istadrut in 1922, was to go to every Jewish employer who employed Arabs, to the Baron Rothschild settlements, who, who employed the Arabs in the, in the vineyards, to beat up the Palestinian workers, and to terrorize the Jewish employers to say, don't employ Arabs, Jewish labor only. The Istadrut was a major tool in 
ousting the Palestinian workers from the economy of Palestine. When the Palestinians had the great strike of 1936, the railway stopped working, the refineries stopped working, the port of Haifa stopped working, because everybody was Palestinian workers. The Istadrut said to its people, you go and operate these places. And the Istadrut acted as scabs, breaking the strike of the Palestinians, and they were willing to give weapons to Jewish youth to help them fight against the Palestinians. From your perspective, you know, what, what happened in 1948? And, and how does it differ from sort of usual, from Zionist accounts? The war had, uh, had its uh, um, roots in a conflict that, that grew between the British mandate authorities and the Zionist organization. Initially, the mandate authorities promoted Zionist colonization. That was what the mandate was about. The mandate included the, the, the text. The mandate was a document that was granted by the League of Nations. It was actually written by Britain itself as one of the, you know, one of the main victor uh, powers in the First World War. Okay, so the, the text of the mandate included a verbatim the whole of the, what is known as the Balfour Declaration, mm. which is the document in which uh, Britain promised the Zionists to promote, to encourage the, the creation of a Jewish national home in Palestine. The idea from the British point of view was to use this settler community that they were going to promote as a sort of loyal community to protect its own interests in the area. Mm. As the uh, first British governor of Jerusalem, uh, Sir Ronald Storrs, put it, it would create for Britain a little loyal Jewish Ulster in a sea of potentially hostile Arabism, mm -hmm. which, is, which chimed very well with what the perspective of the Zionist movement, the founder of the Zionist movement, Theodor Herzl, uh, said in, in, in his diary that uh, the, the Zionists would form for uh, Europe, didn't include America at the mm -hmm. time as, as the sort of civilized nation of the world, for Europe a, a, a bastion, a, 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 fort, a, a fortress against Asiatic barbarism. The idea was, you see, because the, 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 the Zionists had, uh, uh, coming back to the Zionist project, mm -hmm. They had a problem. You see, in, in Australia, in North, North America, in Alger, uh, Algeria, uh, the settlers were nationals of uh, an empire that put them there mm. and protected them there and uh, used them to serve its own lo interests locally. The Zionist project was not uh, manned. I mean, the people who actually uh, did the colonization were not nationals of uh, the empire that ruled the place. They didn't have a mother country to protect them. They needed a surrogate mother. Mm. So from the beginning, the Zionists looked for protection, for, for sponsorship by whichever empire was dominant in the region. Mm. And after the First World War, it was Britain. Mm. Uh, they, they got this protection, they got this deal, but they were a little bit at cross purposes. What Britain wanted was a local, uh, loyal, settler community which, which it would use against the surrounding population. Mm -hmm. The Balfour Declaration, declaration did not uh, actually promise the Zionists a nation state, mm -hmm. an independent sovereign nation state. That was, was more than, than, than Britain actually okay. wanted. Whereas the Zionists actually wanted the latter. Gradually, during the 1930s, a, a, a rift began to uh, uh, open up between the British Empire and the Zionist project. The Zionist project wanted more than Britain was uh, prepared to give, especially because its interests in the other parts of the Middle East, in, in the surrounding Arab countries, were threatened by its sponsorship of Zionism. It, it came under pressure because 
the, the surrounding Arab parts of the Arab nation were unhappy about mm. what Britain was doing in Palestine. So Britain started from the 1930s to restrict uh, its, its support for uh, Zionism. And this is how contradiction, a, a conflict arose where, uh, whereby the, the uh, Zionist settlers started to rebel against Britain and try to get rid of it. Not in order to uh, give Palestine as a whole independence with majority rule. Of course, they didn't want the Jews were still a minority there but in order to create uh, their own independent uh, Jewish state. So uh, Palestine became ungovernable, and Britain brought the issue to the United Nations, and the United Nations uh, uh, passed a resolution on the 29th of, of November 1947 mm -hmm. to partition Palestine. This was, this was a disastrous legacy of the British Empire in three places. Yeah. In India, where... They, they couldn't rule the place anymore, so they, they partitioned it. Mm. That was a purely British arrangement. Yeah. In Cyprus uh, and in Palestine. In Palestine, the partition was, was a, a United Nations resolution. And, and um, uh, although the country still had a, a, a predominant Arab majority, the Jewish settlers were a minority, the partition resolution gave the, the Jewish state uh, a little bit over half, and the uh, pre projected Palestinian Arab state a little less than half. And uh, here I'm coming to something that is now topical. Jerusalem and its whole surrounding, including Bethlehem, was supposed to belong neither to the Jewish state nor to the Palestinian Arab state, but to be internationally ruled. And this is the reason why after the, the uh, war of 1947-49, no country recognized Israel rule over Jerusalem mm -hmm. and they did not recognize the, uh, 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 Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Anyway, so, so this, this was the situation. Obviously, the, the Palestinian Arabs and the surrounding Arab uh, uh, peoples resented this resolution, which gave the minority of Jewish Zionist settlers in mm -hmm. Palestine uh, more than half of the territory of their, of the, their homeland. Mm -hmm. Okay? So uh, this was the background of, the, of the, uh, uh, that war. Mm -hmm. They uh, refused to accept the, the, the uh, United Nations resolution. The Zionists actually did accept it, uh, hoping to use what they pr predicted correctly would be a war to actually go beyond it, mm. which is exactly what they did. Even before Israel was actually declared, which was in, on the 15th of, of May, 1946, Eight. Mm. Right after the United Nations resolution, a civil war actually developed in Palestine between, basically, between the, the uh, Palestinian Arab majority and the, the Zionist settlers, and uh, ethnic cleansing started right away. And so, when you say about ethnic cleansing, could you explain what that what that entailed? Well, it, what, what that entailed was that uh, when part of Palestine that was inhabited by Palestinian Arabs mm. came under the uh, rule, under the, the control of the, first of all, the, the Zionist armies before the cre creation of the Haganah, basically, mm -hmm. which was the precursor of the Israeli uh, mm -hmm. army, mm -hmm. before, before May 1948, and under the official Israeli army after nine, uh, uh, May 1948, they were evicted. Yeah. Uh, they, I mean, they were encouraged, as it were, uh, willy-nilly to leave their homes and to, to go uh, mm -hmm. towards the border. If it was, the, the, let's say, the north of Palestine, the Galilee, mm -hmm. they were pushed towards Lebanon and Syria. Okay. Yeah, so, and, and I think, you know, th there's, there's clear historical evidence of all that. And I know I've seen uh, in videos online some of 
your colleagues here in Matspan saying that when they arrived in Israel in 1948, you know, they saw the refugees leave, you know, the original inhabitants leaving with all of their stuff. One of your, um, one of the other colleagues in Matspan said when he, when he told people at his university that he saw that and they have an argument, they beat him up. Um, for, for saying that he saw them sort of leaving. So, what what what's the Zionist account of what of what happened? Well, no one disputes the fact that that the uh, majority of the Palestinians, Palestinian Arabs who lived in what in the territory that became part of Israel in 1948, left the country. The question is whether they left of their own will, and secondly, whether there was any plan. To displace them. That mm -hmm. was that is the dispute, but I think by now it has been proved conclusively yeah. that uh, there was such a plan. I mean, the whole of Zionist uh, history and the uh, documentation of the Zionist movement is full of discussion how to get rid of the the uh, Palestinian Arab population. And the, the war of 1947-49 presented uh, an opportunity mm -hmm. to do this. So can you tell us a little bit about your political development? Uh, you know, sort of how did you come to, to break with Zionism? Um, well, yeah, it, 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 was, it was a sort of gradual process. I, I, I uh, was, as a teenager, until the age of about 16, I was a member of Hashomer Hatzair, which is a, a left-wing Zionist uh, youth movement sponsored by MAPAM, used to be the, the sort of leftist Zionist uh, uh, party uh, in Israel. I, the, now, the, the ideology of Hashemarathy was, was a very interesting and self-contradictory mm -hmm. amalgam between Zionism and Marxism. Uh, their Marxism at the time, and we are talking about, I, I joined Hashemarathy in about 19... 48, 49. How old would you have been? I, I, I was born in 1936. Okay, wow. So, so, so I, was, 12, I was about 12, yeah. 12, 13, mm. yeah. uh, uh, about 12 when I joined mm. the And uh, at that time, its uh, Marxism was a very Stalinized form of Marxism. Mm. Uh, they, they were actually sort of supporters of the Soviet Union, except for, on the question of, of, of Zionism, where they had difference. That there is some kind of contradiction between the Marxism hmm. and the Zionism. I think one of the things with Hashem al Hatzair is that, well, I mean, my understanding of Hashem al Hatzair is that they thought of themselves as liberating the Palestinians from. Uh, from like Palestinian feudal landowners, and that, they that was their excuse. That was their sort of yeah. So oh, we we're, we're going to establish Jewish socialism, Jewish socialism that would then liberate. We are bringing progress to them. Yeah, so, I mean they were not sponsoring collaboration or or, mm -hmm. or joint uh, struggle between Jewish and Arab workers. Mm -hmm. They were not. Their their perspective was to bring socialism to. To the country, not by uh, class struggle of the of the working class, whether mm -hmm. uh, Jewish or or mm -hmm. Arab or whoever, but by by founding collective funds, mm -hmm. the, the which are of course kibbutzim, which are mm -hmm. pure, purely Jewish, of course. But that was the, at that time that wasn't what worried us, but was the whole thing that that there was no class struggle in in this uh, whole project. I mean that there there. Kind of, their Zionism was a, a imbued with a, a settlement projects, but not with class struggle. So this this ammo didn't fit in with the Marxism because you, Marxists actually, I mean, the most basic thing is that is that socialism would come about through class struggle, and there was no element of class struggle in 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 their practice and in their project actually in in Israel mm. at the time. So that, that sort of worried us, and we, we uh, raised this question, and this uh, led to our expulsion eventually. <laughs> that was my, my first, I, I Your been first expelled, expulsion. I've been expelled three times. The, the, my first expulsion was at the age of 16 from a The thing was that 
at the time we didn't question Zionism as such, mm -hmm. but we did question the form of Zionism that was uh, advocated by Ashmeretzi, which, mm -hmm. which I mean, had nothing to do with the class struggle. And so, and so, how did that? Play out in the com these well, the Israeli Communist Party's uh, sort of anti-Zionism or, or non-Zionism. The, the Israeli Communist Party and the Palestinian Communist Party that preceded it during the, the time of the mandate in the mm -hmm. interwar period did regard Zionism as a colonizing movement and 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 oppose it as such. This this uh, element disappeared. Slightly, or was was from the Palestinian from, Communist from, Party from, from the Israeli Communist Party. Mm. They stopped referring, or they didn't stress this element of Zionism being a, a, a colonizing project. Mm -hmm. What they stressed was that it is a, a protege of American imperialism and mm -hmm. and its anti-Soviet stance. Okay. But they did not accept, of course, the, the idea that the Jews all over the world are a nation and that, they're, they're, that Israel is their, is their homeland and so on. So mm -hmm. to this extent, we became non-Zionists or, or opposed to you know, some elements in, in the mm -hmm. uh, Zionist ideology. As part of his break with Zionism, Aki also found himself moving towards the Israeli Communist Party. In this clip, Aki explains how it happened as a result of his strike with fellow merchant seamen in the early 1950s. And I, because I was a, a kid who grew up by the beach and I learned swimming by myself, I uh, became a swimming champion. I was the, the champion of Maccabi in 200 meters breaststroke, 45, 46, 47. Then, because I was a swimming champion, when the war of 47 broke out, I was still, I haven't finished high school. I was 17 in 1948. I was one year before finishing high school. But they drafted us at 17, before we finished matriculation, before the high school. And the Navy wanted to take me into the Navy because I was a swimmer. So I went into the Navy. And I never fought in 1941, in 1948. I mean, I fought, I was mobilized in the Navy, but there was nothing at sea. Nothing, because the Palestinians never had a Navy. So I spent two years on ships traveling in the Mediterranean, uh, doing fuck all. And then I was released, and I went into the Merchant Navy. And the Merchant Navy, I, I, I started on, on a ship that went from Haifa to New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, and back to Haifa. From Haifa empty, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York loaded, and then three month trip. And after three months, I arrived back and I started as a deck boy. They didn't count my sea time at, as a, in, the, in the war navy. They said it doesn't count. And I came back to Haifa and I get my pay slip for three months, pay 12 hours per day because you had to do eight hours watch keeping, holding the wheel in those days, and four hours overtime at sea. And you can't say no, you have to do the overtime. So 12 hours, three months, I come back to Haifa, I get the pay slip, deduction, income tax, union tax, this, that. At the end it says, you owe the company $50. <laughs> I said, what? After three months of 12 hour day, I owe the company? I go to the union to talk to the secretary. The shipping company was owned 50% by the tra trade union movement, Istadrut, and 50% by the government. I go to the, trade to the Siemens Union building, and the guy who is in charge of the union, the secretary of the union, I say to him, listen, what is this? My first pay slip in my life, huh? I have to pay the company? And he I suddenly realized he was never a seaman. He was never elected. He was appointed by the Eastern Route. Moreover, not a seaman, not elected, appointed by the Eastern Route. From 8 to 12, he acted as Siemens Union Secretary, had a lunch break, went and then he sat on the board of directors of the shipping company. The same guy. The same guy, because the Sadrut wanted to save the uh, expenses, so they put the same guy both on the shipping uh, director of the shipping company and in the union. So we, the, the, and you know, everybody was outraged. We were about 600 seamen then, there were about 30 ships. We said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we want elections. The Istadrut wouldn't let us have elections. We had to fight for the elections. In the end, we had elections. 
And no one of the Istadrut candidates, they had a campaign of uh, terrorizing people and bribing people. No one of the Istadrut candidates won. All won that won were elected to the Siemens Union were Siemens which we, the Siemens themselves elected. So we had our own delegation elected by us. Istadrut comes and says, we don't recognize the results of the elections. We said, what do you mean we don't recognize? There were elections and they were not rigged. You agree? He says, look in the book of rules. In the book of rules of the Istadrut, it says, in order to be a legal representative of workers, one must be A, elected by the workers, B, authorized by the leading, uh, author leading bodies of the Istadrut. Uh, because the Istadrut was actually the economic arm of labor Zionism. And they were afraid that trade unionistic demands would conflict with nationalism. So they built it. You had the bureaucracy of the union before you had the organized workers. And the bureaucracy organized the whole thing so that everything depended on the bureaucracy. For example, uh, they deducted union fees from me. The union fees didn't go to the union. The union fees went to a central uh, department, which then dished them out to the unions. If the union doesn't play, they don't get the money from the Istadrut. So it was a centralized organization, completely ruled from the top, and, na and, and seeing to it that no union will uh, start to become too uh, trade unionistic. So we had a, we called the, the Istadrut said, we don't recognize the leader, your, your election result. So we had a strike against the Istadrut, 40 days, 40 days. I was in New York when the strike began. I heard about the strike from New York stevedores in November 1941. Someone from the St New York stevedores came to us and said, listen, you know there's a strike in Haifa? We said, no. We said, yes, there is a strike. We heard it on the radio. We saw on, there was no TV then. And uh, I think I was in, in WeHo, in, no, WeHo, in Brooklyn, Greenpoint Avenue. There is a dock there. I was in Greenpoint Avenue, and they came to us and said, there is a strike in Haifa. If you want, we will stop loading this ship, and we'll see that nobody else loads this ship. Jesus, you know, I said, well, I didn't know what it means, international solidarity of the working class. It, I didn't know, didn't hear these words, but I was very impressed with the New York stevedores. They came to us, they didn't want anything. They said, if you ask us, we will see to it that nobody will load this ship. So we had a meeting to decide what to do. And the, bet, the people who were not buried, didn't have families, wanted to stay in New York. They said, let's accept it. But the people with the families said, no, 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 we want to go back. And the people with, went back. We decided, they had a the majority. We went back to Haifa. When we arrived in Haifa, people came to us and said, you stay on the ship. Nobody gets off the ship. And why? Because the police will drag you off and Ben-Gurion will bring scabs from Italy and, and, uh, and uh, Greece to run the ships, and if the ships go and we are on strike, you know, we, uh, we, we, we'll, we lose. And we waited on the ship, and I think it was the 20, either the 14th or the 21st of December 1951, I was on the ship I was in the morning, and I saw on the key, on the key we were not on the key, we were tied to the breakwater. It was half a mile of water between us. And we see the police mustering there. 200 people with, it was a rainy day, helmets, shields, batons, overcoats, mostly new immigrants. And on my ship were people who were in the underground, in the Stern Gang, in Haganah, in Herzl, all Israelis, veteran Israelis. And we see, for the first time, I saw 200 or 300 policemen like an army. And I said to myself, wait a minute, who are they coming from? I didn't break the law. A strike is legal. We didn't do anything illegal. Why, is, uh, why are 200 policemen mustering against us? And you know, before this, I never saw so many policemen. This vision of the police as a body of 300 or 400 people with helmets with this, this made me political. I said, wait a minute, the police is not just for catching thieves and directing the traffic. It's a force in society. Who orders them? to come to me, who never broke the law, who is like, involved in an activity which is absolutely legal, and uh, to, 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 to take me off the ship. They came onto the ship. We had a big fight. 
we threw them all off. They couldn't win the ship. And we captured the, the head of the police, Bodinger. He was the father of the guy who later became head of the uh, Israeli Air Force. He climbed on a ladder with a pistol in his hand. We said, fuck you. Who the hell are you to wave a pistol at us? We were in the, in the, in the underground fighting the British. You come here with a pistol? It was, you know, we were, we were uh, outraged. We were not scared. Nobody was scared of the fucking pistol. We were scared. We grabbed him up. We threw the pistol to hell. And then everybody who had a private uh, account with him said, OK, it's your turn now. And we smashed him to pieces. <laughs> then we locked him up in a cabin. We locked him up in a cabin. We were accused for attacking the police. They came to us, and we were accused of attacking. And during the strike, I started to read all the newspapers. And I saw, I said, here I, I experienced something, and I see its description in the press, and I can judge the papers, because I see what is happening. Most of the newspapers, the, the journalists didn't bother to come and find out what's happening in the, in the sea. They sat at home and wrote what they felt or what they thought. And, and many of them were against us. And, but they sat in the office. One newspaper sent a journalist who spoke to seamen and reported as it was, as I saw it, and the leading article was for us. And that was the newspaper of the Communist Party. So I said, they talk, they say the truth, I joined them. So when I left the strike, I became politicized. I wanted to know what is the police. So the police is not only for catching thieves and, uh, and traffic uh, offenses, but they are actually a force intervening in strikes. So I said, hey, hey, on whose side are they? Who gave them orders? And uh, from that I became politicized. Then I joined the CP, and uh, that's the way I became politicized, through a strike. I, I never heard about Marx. How did you come eventually to, to break with the Communist Party? Well, the, it, 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 I, I'm, I'm talking about 1953. Mm -hmm. I, I was, I was uh, 17 at the time, and in the autumn of 1953, I joined the uh, Communist Party. I, I was in the Communist Party, in the local Communist Party, an ordinary member uh, for a few years. Mm -hmm. we, we were expelled in 1962. Okay. So this is expulsion number two. This is expulsion number two. Why okay. were we expelled? Well, we, we felt that the, the I mean, we were unhappy with Stalinism, basically. Mm -hmm. The Stalinism of the, of the Communist Party, which we felt made it more a sort of public relations agency for the Soviet Union rather than a, a, a Marxist revolutionary party. Mm -hmm. We, we uh, were very uh, affected, very unhappy with the, with the events in Hungary in 1956. Mm -hmm. And uh, this be made us very critical. But okay. I mean, can I say for that Hungary '56 was where there was an independent working co working class uprising. There was an uprising in Hungary for it's socialism for, with workers' control, which ended up being crushed that's right. by, yeah, that's by right. Soviet tanks. It was it was an uprising of of the Hungarian people led by the, the Hungarian working class, which was sort of denigrated by by the communists. Mm as a fascist kind of, of uprising. Mm. Uh, historically, the, the Hungarian events coincided with the Suez War of 1956. Mm. They, they happened more or less at the same time. Mm. And by the way, because the, the West was occupied with the Suez crisis, the Soviet Union uh, found it easier to intervene in Hungary. Okay? However, you see, vis-a-vis -vis the Suez crisis, the Communist Party, of which we were members, took a decent line. It opposed the war, and it was isolated in Israel in opposing the war. So this delayed our break with the Communist Party. And we, we had a sort of secret discussion group. It had to be secret because the Communist Party did not allow people from different branches to uh, get together, to form uh, even discussion groups. Uh, you could maybe talk individually to a, a member of, of another uh, branch, 
but not to form regular sort of meetings. And since some of us were in Jerusalem, some in Tel Aviv, we had to keep it uh, a secret. So uh, we started discussing a perspective. We didn't plan immediately to form a, a, a new organization. Uh, but we had this sort of long-term plan that eventually we may have to, you know, to split with the Communist Party. We, we started actually voicing in, in our respective branches criticism of, of the uh, and Communist who, Party. Who were, who were some of these personalities? Well, the, 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 there were two sort of in, uh, initiators in, in, in uh, uh, Jerusalem and two in Tel Aviv. In Jerusalem, it was Akiva Or and me, and in Tel Aviv, it was Odet Pilavsky, who was a you know wonderful guy, a, a, a trade union militant and, and uh, you know a, a working class hero, as it were, uh, and uh, Yermiao Kaplan, who dropped out of Matzpen soon after it was fairly soon after it was formed. Okay. So, but we were surrounded by other people uh, who were uh, uh, not members of the Communist Party, but uh, supporters. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that was another scene, you know, because our discussion group in, in included both members and non-members of the Communist Party. Uh, we, we started to discuss uh, sort of what, what was wrong with the Israeli Communist Party and with the uh, Communist movement. I have to explain to you that the question of Zionism and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the Israeli-Arab conflict, did not feature very highly in our discussion. Luckily for us, the period between 1956 in 1967 was the most quiescent period in the uh, history of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Right? It, when Israel had to withdraw from uh, uh, Suez and Sinai in 1956 or 57 by, by, by then, and until that sort of immediate events that led to the 1967 war, the so-called Six Days War, the, the a, a conflict between Israel and the Arab world was at its least acute. Okay? Yeah. So that, this was not uh, our sort of focus. Our focus was on, on international issues, and on class issues, on the, the, the class nature of Israel, uh, the role of the Communist Party. Matzpen was certainly anti-Zionist, but this is not how we defined ourselves. Mm. Uh, we, first of all, we didn't define ourselves in a negative way. We regarded ourselves as a, as a revolutionary socialist group. Mm. Anti-Zionism was a consequence of this, but I mean, we, uh, uh, we did not think of ourselves as primarily, you know, defined by anti-Zionism. Also, we were not the first anti-Zionist group. We were perhaps the first in, 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 within the history of Israel after it was created. We were the first socialist uh, group that defined itself as, among other things, anti-Zionist. Set up in 1962 by activists who left or were expelled from the Israeli Communist Party in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, Matzpen were soon joined by Arab and Jewish comrades splitting from the Communist Party's branch in Haifa, who brought with them other activists from northern Israel. They joined Matzpen on the following principles, a rejection of Zionism, a rejection of the Soviet Union, Stalinism and the cult of personality, and unequivocal support for revolutionary socialism, international solidarity, and the integration of Israel into a socialist Arab Union. However, it would be with the onset of the 1967 Six-Day War and Matzpen's unequivocal stand against it, as well as Israel's invasion of the occupied territories, that would cement Matzpen's status as national folk devils.
Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, Matt Spain's response to the 1967 Six Day War. Um, but for for the listeners who don't know, uh, can you explain a little bit about what the Six Day War was? I mean, basically, um, Israel was waiting for an opportunity to correct the uh, things or to 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 complete the conquests that uh, were left unconquered in the 1948-49 war, or 47-49 war, really. And also was planning a, a war against uh, Syria. And was also very keen to correct the uh, negative outcome for Israel of the 1956 war, the Suez war, where Israel was you know, a participant together with France and Britain against Egypt, which ended actually with um, Israeli military success but political failure. It was forced to withdraw and it ended negatively, so it was keen to uh, Correct this, all these uh, things that uh, historically uh, it felt you know it, it needed to rewrite them uh, or, or readdress, re redress the balance. Uh, and the opportunity was given to it by a sequence of disastrous mistakes made by Egypt, by uh, Egypt's leader Gamal Abdel Nasser, mm -hmm. who uh, act actually walked into a trap. I mean, he 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 made theatrical moves as though he was going to attack Israel on, on an issue that was in dispute between Israel and Egypt, and that is the uh, passage through the Suez Canal. So, and just quickly, uh, so, uh, Nasser was the, the leader of Egypt, who also was a, like a leading figure in pan-Arabism. Yes, uh, he, was, he, was, he was the most popular secular nationalist progressive you know, sort of left of center, uh, Arab leader of the time. I mean, he was uh, simply adored by, by the Arab masses. His, actually, his prestige was boosted by the outcome of the Suez War. He uh, made overtures as though he was, he was going to, uh, you know, threaten Israel. Uh, he was in opposition to do it, and he knew he, he knew it. But I mean, he actually walked into a, a trap that he set for himself, and allowed Israel to attack as a preemptive strike, as it were. Although uh, the Israeli generals knew that he, the Egypt was in opposition to, to do anything serious to Israel. Most of his, you know, elite forces were then tied down in Yemen. There was a civil war in Yemen. I mean, he he, he had least well trained and least well supplied part of his army in in Sinai. Um, Israel managed to actually destroy the Egyptian air force, which was on the ground because it was, you know, the, it was not really prepared for a serious war. The, the Egyptian Air Force was uh, parked in their, their uh, airfields like sitting ducks, and Israel annihilated the, the Egyptian Air Force in the few first hours of, of the war. So the, the, the war with Egypt was decided. Egypt had a, a, a pact with both Jordan and Syria, so they had to make sort of gestures as, as though they are going to support Egypt. They were Compared, I mean, they didn't make any serious move, but that gave Israel the chance also to strike against Jordan and against Syria. Israel's conquests in the, against Egypt were reversed later. Uh, Israel withdrew from most of its, its conquests from Egypt. The, the whole of the Sinai Peninsula was in, in, under Israeli rule for a few years and then it withdrew. Uh, except for the Gaza Strip, which was administered, never next to Egypt, but administered by Egypt after the uh, 48 war, 1948 war. 
And as well as the Sinai Peninsula, uh, which other... The Sinai Peninsula is, is part of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Egyptian territory was... was uh, uh, and Israel withdrew eventually in, 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 in the 70s, withdrew from... But uh, uh, Israel occupied the Gaza Strip both in 56 and then withdrew, but in 1967 it again occupied the Gaza Strip and remained in occupation until today. But the, the sort of most important annexations that Israel uh, was able to do after the 67 war was the uh, part that he took over, that he conquered from Jordan, that is the West Bank, and the Golan Heights from Syria. So Israel is, uh, is now actually holding a territory that used to be part of the Kingdom of Jordan and part of Syria. And still, you know, the, the Golan is still officially, I mean, uh, internationally recognizes a Syrian sovereign territory occupied militarily by Israel. Israel has annexed it. Do you want to go into the immediate aftermath of 1967? A lot of things that were potential in the pre-67 era became an actuality and developed following it. For example, the um, turn uh, of Zionism towards a more, a darker, more religious, more fanatical form. The space that opened for furthering Israeli colonization which before 67 was an internal colonization, stealing lands from Palestinians who remained inside Israel, taking, taking over their land and turning it over to uh, a Hebrew colonization. Whereas in the preceding era, it was quote-unquote socialist uh, uh, ideology that was leading colonization, which was sort of Possible, let us say, in the in the early part of uh, of the twentieth century, when even you know in the Second International there were people who supported colonialism, you know, in in, in the socialist movement, if, even before the, the the First World War, certainly after. But by 1967, and we are in the in the era of decolon already decolonization, you know, following following the Second World War, most colonial possessions were being decolonized. And, and this was mainly in colonies which were uh, dependent on the labor power of the indigenous people. There was hardly any, if, if at all, any decolonization in colonies which did not depend on labor power of the indigenous people. Anyway, socialist-led colonization was, was, not a, was not a viable uh, alternative. Instead, what served the, as an ideology to justify Israeli colonization of the West Bank was, was a religious-based uh, Zionism, which made what had before been a sort of implicit and shy reference of Zionism to uh, religious uh, ideas. I referred to it before. I mean, yeah, so most, being, being an atheist and sort of not believing in God, but, but still thinking God yeah, has given because, you these. Because what well, you know that because basically the the only uh, justification that they could even in the older older uh, period uh, justify their their claim on Palestine is based on on religious documents. Mm. Uh, what else? I mean, the the, the 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 Jewish ties to Palestine are basically religious. So even secular Zionists had to sort of refer to it implicitly. But uh, in, in 1967, it, it started to become very explicit. Could you speak also about the, the aftermath of the 67 war for Palestinian uh, refugees? Uh, first of all, there was a, a, a certain amount of ethnic cleansing from the uh, West Bank and massive ethnic cleansing from the Syrian Golan Heights. Operations by Palestinian nationalists, especially the Fatah group, which dominates the, the PLO, 
uh, started and Fatah, who, which was uh, the group of uh, yes, Arafat. Arafat. Yes, Arafat. It, yes, it, 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 it was the most most numerous and most uh, uh, dominant faction in the Palestinian nationalist movement. It started operations against Israel before the '67 war. Uh, eventually, the basis for these operations were in Syria, which is why, as I mentioned before, Israel. This is another reason why Israel was waiting for a chance to attack Syria. But then, you know, the, the uh, events of June '67 gave Israel the chance to attack Syria. And then, gradually, resistance to Israel began. Uh, slowly to to take place within the territories that Israel occupied. The main basis for this uh, operation was Jordan until uh, 1970. So, you know, with the war and, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people uh, being displaced, as you said, uh, you know, obviously Mats Ben was was active in Israel at the time. Yes, I mean, we, 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 I mean, we had no uh, hesitation. Uh, in fact, we were, as it were, uh, uh, ideologically and, and uh, otherwise prepared to take a, a, a position against uh, the war. I mean, it didn't, I mean, we, we were uh, among the very few people who were not swept up by, by the sort of uh, hysteria of, uh, you know, celebrating the the great Whig victory and so on. Mm. And uh, so, what what sort of activities did uh, did Matt Spen organize or you know take part in? During well, the it was Civil most War? most mostly you know propaganda and, and I mean what what other uh, uh, kind of operation that does a political uh, group take? I mean, we we were not part of a, a military resistance to uh, uh, Israel. We try to explain. I mean, the, the, some of our comrades, you know, were signatories to a famous uh, the, the, the statement that appeared a short time after the war, in, actually in September, uh, when sort of the dust settled, uh, calling for uh, Israel to withdraw immediately. It's, it's, the text is hanging in my study. A photocopy of it, which was published in the Aretz on the 22nd of September 1967, calling for with immediate withdrawal. Otherwise, you know, occupation leads to uh, resistance, resistance leads to terror and counter terror, and you know, it will, will become a nation of uh, murderers and murder victims. At the time, it was considered, you know, outrageous, but since then, a lot of people, I mean, those who are now in, in opposition to what is happening, and that, that, that includes uh, even some Zionists, regard it as a prophetic statement. But I mean, he didn't need to, to have, you know, pro, you know, prophetic inspiration to, to guess what would happen if Israel remained in occupation. And you say, you know, the 67 war kind of kicked off, or well, didn't kicked off, I suppose, the roots of, of nationalist hysteria were sort of always kind of in, in Israel. But it's sort of, there, around the 67 conflict, uh, there was, uh, you know, basically a wave of unadulterated uh, hysteria. Yes. Um, and then obviously Matt Spen came along and said, this is, yeah, this I is mean, not this, right. This... Was, there, was there any kind of well, was there any kind of backlash? I yes. Suppose? Oh, yeah. We were hounded. I mean, we were sort of attacked by all the media. We felt very much besieged, but we we stuck to what what we believed in. Could you could you give some examples, maybe, of uh, of you know the ways that we, you sort of you were harassed or that, uh, well, you know, nowadays you would get a lot of a lot of uh, trolling, uh, <laughs> but you know, it, it, uh, in those days it was merely you know usually by telephone, you know, threats, you know, death, uh, murder threats, and so on were were you know done by by telephone. Mm. My I, I had two young children at the time. Uh, they would pick up the phone and, and hear, you know, threats against their father. We are going to kill him. Mm -hmm. um, and that, well, that is an example. But I mean, there was a general atmosphere of, you know, sort of 
uh, incitement against us. So in in what way incitement? I look at me, political incitement. You know these are these are traitors, and you know that they, they shouldn't be allowed to operate and so on. And um, so, as well as maybe from you know random right wingers, was there any? Uh, it wasn't random right wingers. It was the bulk of public opinion. I mean, I, it's it, you know it wasn't just you know sort of uh, uh, loonies on the on the on the uh, 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 extreme right fringe. It was uh, sort of the major part of public opinion. No, but I mean the, the obviously you had. Uh, you know, you had individuals who were phoning you and like leaving threatening messages yeah. or, you know, these things. Was there any backlash also from security service? Well, first of all, I mean, the, the, the moment the, the, the war broke out, our Arab comrades were, uh, for the most part, arrested. Just as, as a precaution. Yeah, <laughs> Just to come back to the to the Six Day War, because obviously Mats Ben is this kind of this small group in this you know mass wave of uh, of, yeah. of nationalism. You know, was any progress made yes. uh, in that period? Yeah, I mean, I mean, yes. You see, until uh, 1967, we were a marginal, unknown group. As you know, people say, any publicity is good. So I mean, by by becoming the sort of the the pole, an isolated pole of opposition, we were opposed to the the whole idea of the Zionist regime, uh, uh, and we're calling for dezionization of Israel before the '67 war. But I mean, we were you know just a small group publishing an obscure monthly uh, journal. Then we became notorious. Well, that's it for part one. In part two, we hear from other members of Matt's Pen and look at what happened after 1967. Our Patreon supporters can listen to that now, um, and you too can support our work, get early access to this episode and all others as well as other benefits at patreon.com slash working class history part two will be up for everyone else next week massive thanks to our patron supporters who make this podcast possible thanks also to louise barry for editing this episode and to max blumenthal for the audio clip of aki catch you next time